Okay guys, today this is just gonna be an introductory video into a series that I'll make about building the BC50 into the vehicle that I sort of want it for, which I envisage as being more of a touring thing than it is a hardcore four wheel driving thing. I'm building the car out mostly for travel, but we're just gonna go through some of the ideas behind the build, some of the different concepts and values that different people place on vehicles. I'll go through what my main priorities are with the build, and then obviously, as a starting point, we'll give starting costs, weights, and any other things that might be relevant on the car. So as the series progresses, we have a starting point to refer back to. That's basically the idea behind this video. So here's the car as I bought it with the original tray. It's 2100, it didn't fit in the garage. And you can see the total weight there. So that is 73% of the GVM. Uh, I've got the weights and the dimensions there in the top left corner. It's 5685 as measured with the bull bar and the tow ball and the original tray. Here's your approach and departure angles, which is probably less with the bull bar and the tow ball on it. With the 265, 17s, it's 1810 to the top, 80 litre fuel tank, 17 inch factory alloys. And we've also got a weighting depth of 800 millimetres as standard from factory. Alright guys, so you've seen the car, now I'm just going to briefly describe how I came to choose what I chose. One of the first things I was looking for was an automatic. I've always owned manuals and I like them, but as a tourer I wanted more comfort, more control on the sand and just an easier experience. Extra cab gives me an extra 300mm of loading space in front of the axle, which was important to me because I wanted to eventually have a canopy on it. Uh, I went for a pre-DPF, now that was purely a reliability thing. I think they're not quite trustworthy yet and I don't mind getting one, but maybe further down the track. No unnecessary tech, it's just more stuff that can go wrong. All your rear cross traffic alerts and this sort of stuff, I actually didn't want that, which kind of helped with the pre-DPF thing because I was looking pre-2015. Low kilometres, took a long time to find, but I picked this up with 35,000 kilometres on it which I think was a really good find. Few existing mods, especially 12 volt system. I wanted to do the whole 12 volt myself. I wanted to do the majority myself. This just had a ball bar and some lights. Value, very hard to find. During COVID, I was looking for about nine or 10 months for a car before I found this one. And we'll go through the costs in a second, but I think I found it at a reasonably good price. So wanting an extra cab with an automatic pre-DPF, that basically ruled out the Toyota Hilux because all the extra cabs were manual. Even if it didn't, I wouldn't have gone with the Hilux anyway just because it's not a good value proposition. None of them are really my fan favourites. I'm not anti anything. Hiluxes live on a reputation that they built a long time ago. I still think they're probably the best off-road. So the Mitsubishi Triton didn't see extra cabs. They did exist, but very rarely did they come up. And you also, with the shorter wheelbase, you have a better turning circle, but you have less room from the rear axle to the rear of the cab. So any eventual canopy that would have been mounted would have had less storage space from axle forward. They're by far the best value for money, and if I ever bought a brand new in the future, I would heavily consider a Triton. But for what I was looking for, it sort of came down to BT50s, Rangers, and D-Maxes. Now, the D-Max was actually my preference because of the reliable engine and it had the reliable Toyota transmission. Uh, I think it's an ASIN. The D-Max to me was sort of what the Hilux used to be. It was now the most reliable of all the dual cab utes or extra cab utes. And there were quite a few on the market that were automatic extra cabs, but quite hard to find one with low kilometers. I found one really good low kilometer one, um, but unfortunately it was at John Hughes and they were just delusional with their pricing. When the BT50 popped up, for the same price at 35,000 kilometers on the odometer. It had the added advantage of hill descent control, climate control, and a factory rear diff locker. To me, it was a no-brainer, pretty easy choice. It came with an ARB bull bar. I think ARB, if not a little bit overpriced, but they're some of the best products you can buy. And having it on the car saved me having to outlay that cost, which would have been three to three and a half thousand dollars, including fitting. 
So the BT50 back then it was basically a Ford Ranger. I was very aware of the poor reputation that the transmissions have, the 6R84 transmissions, when exposed to high temperatures. So getting a low kilometre variant at 35,000 kilometres and then intending to put a transmission oil cooler on from an early stage, I think I can avoid a lot of these issues. It's not like every transmission has blown up. So the car I bought was low kilometres, but it did have a towable and a bull bar which led me to think that it might have been used for towing. I might do a transmission fluid flush early on, fit an oil cooler, and I think that will protect the transmission pretty well and I shouldn't have any issues. All right, so accessories that were already fitted to the car. I was looking for a car that didn't have a lot done, 12 volt setup especially. I wanted the wiring to be quite clean. So this car did have spotlights. They're not high quality spotties, they're just some King's LEDs. Lighting for me at this stage is not a priority, so I think I'll just run them until they no longer work and then I'll look at upgrading because I want to spend my money elsewhere straight up. Came with an ARB Deluxe Bull Bar that has a spot for a winch. Now this was perfect for me because the outlay on one of them is probably three and a half thousand dollars with fitting. I don't know if I necessarily would have bought ARB but I do like the bull bars and I'm happy that it has one. And it came with four Toyo open country all terrains with about 75 to 80 percent of the tread still on the tyres. So that was really good as well and that was basically it. Pretty standard vehicle. Now the tyres are 265, 65, 17 which is not very big. I probably will go bigger at some point, mostly for clearance reasons and possibly a more aggressive all-terrain. I don't plan on getting mud terrains at this stage, but things do change, so we'll just wait and see. Purchase price cost me $40,000 and stamp duty is $2,000 on that, so 42 grand out of pocket. And that D-Max that I wanted was advertised at 43, sat there for about three or four months before John Hughes finally dropped it to 39 and then it sold, which gave me a lot of confidence that I was pretty accurate with the value that I was assigning to cars through the research stage, which was hard to judge through COVID. I'd been looking for nine or 10 months by this stage. I'd had a lot of saved cars in car sales and then I could monitor the prices and the tracking of prices. So when this came up for 40,000, I think it was a pretty good price. I was happy to pay it pre-COVID, Probably would have dropped three, three and a half thousand dollars off that, but you've got to live in the times that you're in. So after owning the car for about a year, pros and cons. Pros, it is good to drive, comfortable, it rides well, it's got climate control, comes with heaps of power. The fuel economy, I get a true 11.1 litres per 100k, which I was pretty happy with. It came with all-terrain tyres, four of them, in good condition, and a bull bar. It has downhill ascent control, and it's got a rear diff lock from factory. Now, some of the cons, the turning circle was quite bad. With the 2100mm tray on it, it's extremely long. I measured it to just under 5.7 metres, so anywhere you park it, you sit about 200mm to 300mm out of the parking space, so it's really annoying to try and find a car spot for it because of the length. With the 2100 tray, the tow bar, and the ARB bull bar fitted, it's quite a long vehicle. Uh, a possible con is the fact that it had no mods done to it, except for a bull bar and a tow ball, means it more than likely towed a caravan. And the other con is that it's quite a heavy car to begin with. Uh, compared to the D-Maxes and Hiluxes, you're looking at a car that's between 1 to 200 kilos heavier, depending on which models you're comparing and stuff like that. So as a starting base, it's quite a heavy vehicle. I weighed it at about 2.3 tonnes already. So my approach to the build. So the things I'm going to be looking for in the build is weight savings because the car is already heavy. So I don't mind paying more for good quality stuff that weighs a little bit less. And then doing things like an upright fridge rather than having a slide out drawer fridge, which adds a lot of weight. So I'll look to do things like uh, lithium batteries over AGM, both for reliability as well as weight savings. Uh, I'll be looking for a lightweight canopy, which uh, it's all relative. Obviously, it's going to be heavy anyway. But the original tray I had on it was a heavy duty steel, which weighed 230 kilos. Removing that and adding a canopy. It's not going to add a huge amount. It will add a little bit, especially when you start to fill it out, but it's not going to add too much. In regard to costs, I've no issues with spending more to get really good products for something that I think 
I'm going to need for a long time. So what I mean by that is you sort of have to prioritise what's important to you. So for me, 12 volt system, air compressor, eventually when I buy a fridge, these things I'm going to buy good quality, as good as I can sort of find for the things that are important to me. Other things, I don't mind going a bit cheaper if I feel like I won't be using it or relying on it too much, like an awning, for example. I don't mind buying cheap just to figure out how I want to use it and then if it gets ruined and then upgrading later down the track when I have saved up more money. But the initial investments, where the money will go, are the things that I think are far more important. I don't want to have a compressor fail on me and the 12 volt system is the other one for me that I think is really important. But the most expensive thing doesn't mean it is the best thing. So for example, I won't necessarily buy ARB or Red Arc because they're the most expensive. I don't think that makes them the best. I think they have some of the best products on the market, but not all of them. But you can find alternatives that are equally as good, if not nine tenths as good for a lot cheaper. So it comes down to that value proposition, how much you're gonna get out of it for the money that you're willing to put in. In regards to tires, at this stage, I'll be keeping the 265, 617s. Because they have quite a decent amount of tread left on them, there's quite a lot of kilometers I can get out of them. Now, alternatively, I could sell them to offset the cost of new tires. Tires are quite expensive, especially I'll more than likely be buying six of them to have two spares. But there's no point getting rid of something that's in really good condition at the moment for something that I don't need yet. I think as I drive it more, I might start to desire a more aggressive tread pattern and a little bit more ground clearance for the diffs which you can only get through tyres, you can't get it through suspension lift. So further down the track, I will upgrade the tyres. Wheels that it came with are rated to 925 kilos. Now, you can buy a lot stronger four-wheel drive specific wheels, but 925 kilos per corner, that's 3.7 tonne total load rating. The GBM is 3.2, the current weight of the car is 2.36. Now obviously those load ratings need to be higher for when you are off-road when one wheel will bear a lot more weight on the car but for the type of driving that I intend doing for now I don't think it will be an issue and I think having one spare will be fine because I won't be doing an extremely remote track on these factory alloys. So as much as possible except where it becomes impractical or a matter of safety I want to try and do a lot of the work myself. Now the reason for this is not just saving costs, which is one part of it, but the other thing is I want to know how it all works. So if something goes wrong when I'm not at home in the garage, I might have a chance of fixing it or at least diagnosing what the problem is, which will assist someone else in fixing it down the track. So things like 12 volt, you know, mounting compressors and air tanks, maybe making up some small shelves and stuff like that. But if there is a purpose-built product on the market that is stronger and lighter weight than something I could manufacture myself, I have no dramas with purchasing that and just doing a fitment myself. These third-party items have been tried and tested. They're strong, durable, and lightweight. Things like drawer systems and shelves and stuff like that, I'll more than likely purchase and just do the install myself. So to me, a touring build can be broken up into a few sections. Every modification that you do falls into some sort of category. It's kind of hard to make neat umbrellas for everything because some things will come under two categories, but the way I break it down is engine reliability, off-road reliability and protection, off-road performance, comfort and camping, 12 volt system, safety, which for me includes lighting and communication, and accessories and other, which sort of captures everything that doesn't quite fit into the other part. So some of these things could arguably fall under engine reliability and off-road reliability or 12 volt system and comfort and camping. A lot of these things have crossovers, but for me to break it down, that is sort of how I roughly divide everything. And then I'll just try and pick the most appropriate category for it to sit in. So early stages of the build, a lot of the focus will be on reliability. To me, that's key. So I'll just show you in the computer a little Word document that I've made which sort of helps me figure out how I want to process things. Alright guys, so this is just a Word document that I've made to sort of keep track of everything I do with the car. Um, this is the bit that I wanted to highlight, but I'll just scroll through what I've got anyway. This is just a table, car weights and prices. This total column down here, I automatically update and it is the sum of all the numbers above it. This is the weight added or removed 
through each different stage and this is the install time just so I have a rough idea of how much time I've spent working on the car. So these things here I've purchased but I haven't mounted yet so at the moment they've added zero weight and zero hours. So car weights and prices is for things that are on the car full time. Accessory weights and prices. This is a little different. This is a bunch of things that I've purchased just so I can get a rough idea of how much I'm actually spending on accessories. While going on a trip I move this number into this column and then update this and it will give me the value of what I'm taking on the trip. But the more important thing is the trip weight. So if I'm going on a trip, I can go through here. Everything that I'm taking for that trip, I copy that number into here and then everything that's in the vehicle will get added up to the total weight here for that trip. That's the idea behind this. I'm a little bit behind in keeping it up to date and some of these things I could remove for example, I'm never going to take a disc brake pad spreader on a trip, but the reason it's listed here is more so I can maintain a list of what I'm actually spending on the car, not so much for the weight component. Some of these other things, like an awning, can be removed. It's unlikely to be removed, but I didn't want to put it as a permanent weight because it can be removed and it might be changed later on down the track. So as an example, say I go on a trip and I take a swag and, and the stretcher for the swag, Cool, I don't know how to do computering. And say that's all I'm taking for the trip. Command option, shift U. So I know I've added 29.3 kilos. I can add this weight to the total weight of the car and that'll give me my total weight, which hopefully is under GVM. This is just my best estimate, load distribution estimation. When I did the weigh bridge, it was 2360, 1340 at the front, 1020 on the rear. The point of this table is more for when I build out the canopy, I know if I am loading up too much on the right hand side to put the fridge on the left hand side to balance it out. This is not obviously going to be perfectly weighted. It is quite vague in the areas of where things will go, but this gives me a rough idea that I'm adding weight to the right part of the car in order to make the car drive as well as possible, having an even load distribution. So this isn't really relevant now. It's more relevant for when I have a canopy and I start putting things inside. In here, I just track where and when things have been done. So uh, engine oil filter, the amount needed, the type of oil, how often it should be done. And if things get changed, I'll put in either a date or I update the odometer. And then this column here is when that certain thing is next due. So some of this stuff I will do myself, like transmission oil, diff oil. Some will be done during services like engine oil and oil filter. But this way I can track at what odometer reading things were changed and when they're next due, according to this sort of rough estimate. That changes the more dirt you expose your car to, but this is just sort of a guide. Uh, basic info from the brochure of the car. So this is sort of just factory info for my reference. And then in here, this is where I list things according to those categories that I had. Now, things that are written here doesn't mean I'm definitely going to do it. They're just ideas. Obviously, some things could appear under two categories, but I'll just try to sort them out as best as I can. Again, I'm definitely not doing everything that is listed here, but I like having it all visible so I know roughly where I stand, how much money I might still have yet to spend on the car. So I can cross things off that I've purchased and then I know I don't have to worry about them again. At the moment, this stuff's not crossed off, but I can go through and cross that off as I get the bits and pieces and then I can see clearly what I have left to purchase. And if I get any other ideas, I can just add them here and that'll be a good way to keep track of what I haven't yet done. There you go, so that just about wraps up the BT50 build intro episode. So to give you an idea of what I'm prioritizing, it is kind of weight savings. I am happy to spend more money if it means getting quality product. I want to do as much of the work as I can myself. So moving forward, I've already purchased a lot of things. It's just having the time to fit them and make the videos about fitting them doing the weights and costs and all that sort of stuff. So some of the first things I did was an OBD2 scanner, seat covers, get extra wheels and a new tire to do five-way rotation. I tinted the windows, diff breathers, a pre-fuel filter and catch can. So a lot of it is in the works at the moment. I'm just trying to fit everything and film it. I've also, since buying it, I've had it for about a year now, I've sold the tray and ordered a canopy. So that should be fitted soon and then it'll be a matter of doing the 12 volt system and deciding how I want to fill the canopy. Now that might be a slow process, um, cost prohibitive as well. So I'll just sort of grow into it and we'll figure it out as we go. 
So the point of this video, I guess, is just to help you sort of brainstorm ideas. Um, maybe you can start up a sort of Word document as well and sort of think about what you really want to prioritize, where you're going to put the majority of your money. And then those other things that aren't so important, either not worrying about at all or buying a cheap alternative. So for me, things like engine tuning, exhaust upgrades, rooftop tents, these are things one day I might do. But at the moment, they're not priorities. They're kind of on the back burner completely. Things like awnings, I do want. At this stage, I don't want to spend thousands of dollars on the best stuff. I do want it eventually, but I'm happy to have a cheap alternative in the meantime. When it comes to things like your 12 volt battery system, I do not want anything cheap. I want everything to be spot on. It doesn't mean I'm going to get the most expensive gear because I don't consider the Red Arc batteries, which I think are just rebranded revolution power batteries to be any better than Victron or Enerdrive or there's a lot of other good companies out there at the moment that offer the same product as far as I'm concerned uh, for a lesser cost because they don't come with that brand name so most expensive not always best oftentimes it is if you're in the more expensive region you're looking at the better products but it's important to dive deep into everything just to really assess what you need all right so that is it for this episode episode zero zero an introduction that's a look at the car, the starting prices, the starting weights. This is a reference for all future videos as the base point. And it also serves just for me to sort of state my intentions for the build, which obviously are liable to change at any point. Uh, a brief look at how I came to purchase what I did. It's not because I'm a fan of the Rangers or BT50s. I'm not not a fan either. It's just the way things worked out with what I was looking for. Not bashing Hiluxes, D-Maxes, Tritons and Navaras. There's plenty of good builds out there with all of these models. I don't think the car is as important as finding a good model of that specific car. So throughout the course of the series, if you notice anything that I'm doing wrong, just leave a comment because I'm always learning as I go. Thanks for watching. You don't see me. You don't see as many BT50s out there. That's not true. Look at that focus, man, right on the eye.